Hi, we're talking about the poets of World War I this week, and um, primarily we'll focus on the poets Brooke, Sassoon, and Owen. So let me give you a little bit of context for what World War meant to Britain and British literature in some ways. Um, there's a great digital site on World War I and World War I poetry that I'll quote from here, and I've got a link um, here, and I'll put on the course site for you. Uh, the authors of that site point out that the First World War runs through British modern-day psyche like no other conflict. On Remembrance Day Sunday, thoughts turn to the fields of Flanders and the slaughter of Somme and Passchendaele more than they do to any other battle sites of any other war. It's been described as Britain's Vietnam, where the true horror of war touched everyone and everything in the country, breaking through the class barrier and irreversibly altering the social structure of the nation. And this is important for us to know as we read this poetry because it marks a real shift in British consciousness. The context for this war poetry, um, I think it's important that you know there was a progressive loss of innocence that we see in the poetry and I'll talk about as I look at specific poems. Um, the Norton um, states this well, and so you'll see it when you read about this, but they point out that those poets who were involved on the front, however romantically they may have felt about the cause when they joined up, they soon realized the full horror of the war, and this realization affected both their imaginations and their poetic techniques. They had to find a way of expressing the terrible truths they had experienced. Um, and this is a real challenge, of course, for them as writers. So who were the wet war poets? Um, this period, um, 1914 is when the war started, um, was preceded by a generation of poets that um, was really remarkable. Um, Edmund Goss has pointed out that the generation which preceded the war was remarkable for its interest in verse. Never before, except for a few late years of Elizabeth's reign, were there so many poets alive in England in proportion to the number of inhabitants. And again, Elizabeth's reign, we're talking 1600s. Um, so most of this poetry from the period just before the war was a bucolic poetry. It featured naturalistic portraits of rural England and was called Georgian poetry after the King George of that period. But these poets loved England and nature and uh, sort of a romanticism that they were trying to make new for the modern era. And they entered into the first major total war of modern history and they were, you know, sort of blown away by that experience, literally and figuratively, sorry, but found themselves ill-equipped to capture it in verse. And yet they persisted in trying like no other war. There were more poets, I think, in World War I than we've ever seen since. Um, so there's really, I think we could say, three different phases of war poetry. And the first would be idealistic war poetry. I think many of the people who enlisted in the war um, in 1914 believed they were fighting for a good cause, they were defending their nation and the values it represented, and their poetry reflects this sort of optimism, nationalism, and uh, pride. Um, so Rupert Brooke, for example, is a good example of this kind of poetry. His poem, The Soldier, reflects the Georgian interests in England and also the love of England and the sense of it as a leader in morality and beauty. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed. So again, uh, rather than mourning the individual, think of what we're giving to the world by doing this. Um, that The poet embracing the concept of war and trying to find a pastoral way to express that duty. Um, in his patriotic concluding stanza, he celebrates then again the beauty of England. And I th and think this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind no less, gives somewhere back the thoughts of thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds dreams happy as her day, and laughter learnt of friends and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. Again, we get 
in many of the poetry poems of this period a sort of religious feeling um, that's rooted in the beauty, romance, um, and pastoral quality of England. And this is all sort of driven against the German barbarism that these soldiers and most everyone in England felt they were countering by entering the war. So we see, you know, eternal mind, English heaven, there's that religious quality. And that England has a moral duty here to offer the world her sights, sounds, her happy day, her laughter, her friends and gentleness. All of this is what England is bringing to this cause. So it's a very romantic portrait. And there's a lot of poetry like this early in the war. The next phase um, is what we might call the realistic war poetry. And the soldiers have begun to watch the war drag on and they've become very disillusioned. This war became by the second winter, a war of attrition. It was merely um, men stuck in, uh, you know, hundreds of miles of trenches in really horrific conditions, trying to kill each other back and forth, back and forth, the British and the Germans, the British, the French, and you, know, you could say the Allied forces. So this resulted in a bitterness or gallows humor in the poetry. And I think this is captured well in Sassoon's poem, They which again it conveys not only the gallows humor but also a sort of us against them stance for those who were not at the front and didn't know the front. They by Siegfried Sassoon. The bishop tells us, when the boys come back they will not be the same for they'll have fought in a just cause. They led the last attack on Antichrist. Their comrades blood has bought new right to breed an honorable race. They have challenged death and dared him face to face. We're none of us the same, the boys reply, for George lost both his legs and Bill's stone blind. Poor Jim's shot through the lungs and like to die. So you see here that it's reflecting, the poem is reflecting the veiled rage of those who are ignorant, those, those who, you know, might the bishop or even later we'll see in, Zag in Sassoon's poem attacks on uh, higher-ups in the military who are trying to portray the role of the soldiers as heroic. Um, and so that's why I read that in that sort of inflated tone. It's ironic. So when the bishop says just cause or attack on Antichrist, right to breed an honorable race, it's euphemistic. And the poets and soldiers that we are seeing depicted here are no longer happy with this heroic gloss on the war. Um, for the most part, the soldier poets at this point have lost their faith in the war, um, and they're not particularly behind their part in it. They just feel that they're being led to slaughter. Um, the gallows humor then that comes out in the final stanza uh, reflects a way of trying to deal with that, a kind of dark black humor. Um, and he captures that by giving us the vo voice of the boys as a sort of counterattack to the bishop's inflated heroic rhetoric and uh, you know offering up yeah we're none of us the same you know we're all missing b bits and pieces so rather than embrace the altruistic thing theme of change he's capturing the soldiers mocking portrait um, of those who lead them to this chaos and in so doing providing a sort of dark humor to help poet or soldiers get through it. Finally there's a section uh, of, uh, late in the war there's poetry that we would call outspoken protest or anti-war poetry and this starts appearing 1917 to 1918 when the soldier poets had for the most part um, begun to frankly express their rage and disillusionment. So when you read Wilfred Owen's poem Dolce e Decorum S, Pro, Pro Patria Mori is the rest of that line, you'll uh, really see a, a realistic portrait of the horrors and then an indictment of the heroic lies that have been told. This line, Dolce Decorum Est, is a line from the poet Horace, the Latin poet Horace, and it means roughly, it is sweet and right to die for one's country. Uh, Owen has frankly stated this is just a lie. Um, so this is clear in his final lines of the poem, this following his realistic portrait of trench warfare and gassing. Uh, 
He says, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dolce e decorum est pro patria mori, meaning you would not do that if you knew what it was like to die for your country. Um, so again, we see this protest because, it, you know, it is a lie and the poets are no longer trying to pretend that it's heroic or gallant or nationalistic and moral to fight in this war. We need to spend just a minute with Siegfried Sassoon because he's really a very important anti-war poet. Um, all of the po poets late in the war, it seems, uh, at least those who were soldiers, began to feel that a victory for Britain's nationalistic aims could not compensate for the horror, the terror, the pain, and the slaughter that were being daily wrought in the, by the war, that by the uh, critic George Williams. But Sassoon was the first anti-war poet in Britain, and um, his collection, Counterattack, which was published in 1918, is the first book of truly vital anti-war poems ever published in England. So it's important that we take a look at least one of his um, most emphatic anti-war poems from that collection. It's called Base Details. If I were fierce and bald and short of breath, I'd live with scarlet majors at the base and speed glum heroes up the line to death. You'd see me with my puffy, petulant face, guzzling and gulping in the best hotel, reading the roll of honor. Poor young chap, I'd say. I used to know his father well. Yes, we've lost heavily in this last scrap. And when the war is done and youth's stone dead, I'd toddle safely home and die in bed. So again, this is dripping with sarcasm and irony, um, and he's using alliteration um, to drive home the image of these fat uh, military, uh, in this case a major, but higher-ups, blindly leading young men to their death without much care or awareness of what they're putting them through. So puffy, petulant, guzzling and gulping, um, this capturing of uh, the over-the-top quality of these characters by the use of alliteration is one way he drives it home. Um, he's also just fierce in his portrait of them, bald, short, scarlet, uh, puffy, and petulant. Obviously these men um, are no longer fit. And then he drives that sort of uh, glutted quality home when he has them in sitting comfortably in their best hotel reading the honor roll and expostulating about all oh, right i knew his father as if it's some great club and then uh, concluding that yep we lost heavily in this scrap as if it's just another rugby match or um, polo tournament and i think this was typically felt by um, a lot of the soldiers on the front that they were being led to slaughter by people who had a very distorted portrait of what the war was and that they would all die home in bed safely after a well-fed life whereas these young men were being led to death. Finally and hopefully quickly um, poetry of non-combatants was as uh, varied as that of the combatants but if we were to look at Ezra Pound's poem Hugh Selwyn Malberly which I asked you to read and Charlotte Muse's poem The Cenotaph which is a memorial erected at Whitehall in 1920 commemorating the war, you'll see where their ambivalence is clear. For example, Pound in his uh, poem is very direct about English patriotism when he says, there died a myriad and the best among them for an old bitch gone in the teeth for a botched civilization. So we see there an indictment of empire, of royalty, of what led to World War I. And then if we look at Charlotte Muse's poem, we see again um, a sort of embedded bitterness, even as she tries to speak with pride and honor about those who died in the war. When she concludes, only when all is said and done, God is not mocked and neither are the dead. For this will stand in our marketplace. And this is the cenotaph, by the way. Who will sell? Who will buy? Will you or I lie each to each with a better grace? While looking into every busy whore's and huckster's face as they drive their bargains, is the face of God and some young, piteous, murdered face. And so you see, I mean, if we spent some time talking about this when we can online, she's deeply ambivalent 
about capitalism that has been supported by this war and will go on in the face of the Cenotaph. Okay, see you on the discussion board. Thanks.